polyvagal theory is just the idea that how safe we feel, our body feels, is crucial to both our mental and physical health and happiness and ability to live a good life. Welcome everybody back to this week's episode of the Therapy for Dads podcast. I am so very, very excited to have on these two, these two men, these two guests. It's very, very excited because I've been reading Dr. Porges's work for some years now. And so coming to this place of being able to talk with him and not only him, but I think I would guess a special guest for him as well, his son, on their latest book, Our Polyvagal World, and that's going to be our conversation today. But before we jump into that topic, I just want to welcome them. So welcome, Dr. Portis and Seth. How are you guys doing this morning? Well, Travis, thank you for inviting us. It's a pleasure to be here. It's also always a pleasure to be on something with my son and to listen, basically learn from his comments. Yeah. Well, great to be here. Thanks. Yeah. And I, and I thought it would be such a perfect duo because this is a, a a podcast aimed at men and fathers and what a what an amazing thing to have a dad and a son on and talk about this and i would love to talk about a couple things one we're engaging in your new book which comes out i believe at the end of the month in about a week or so right number 26 yeah nine days away or how are you guys feeling about that 11 days away sorry good yeah it's fun <laughs> for me i kind of look at it as a barometer of how well polyvagal theory is accepted within the uh, general population because the book is really targeted at a consumer and not at a therapist so i'm i'm kind of like to me it's like looking into this barometer or literally crystal ball of how how the theory has been embedded within culture so i'm i'm curious yeah. And, and reading the book, it is very accessible. It really is. I read some of the work, the more, you know, I guess, graduate level work. And it's this is really well done just reading and like, yeah, it makes sense. It feels it, it reads nicely. You kind of get the concepts. I mean, I obviously had some idea of going in to what polyvagal theory was, but kind of trying to read it with fresh eyes was really just, yeah, it flowed well. You kind of captured all the essence of it. And it just it just made sense. It was like, okay, I get this concept. If I didn't know anything about this, I'd come in and, and walk away with a really good understanding of this of this concept, along with some kind of ideas of engaging in some other big topics like education and uh, other other areas like the prison system and things like that. And so I thought that was very fascinating at the end. But what kind of, I guess, what led to this? Was it really just we want to make something more accessible that isn't so like heady? but something you know, that anyone can pick up and read? I'll, I'll start, and then I want Seth to kind of carry the ball for a while. But I will tell you, as an academic, what is the most frustrating uh, experience of being an academic? And that is the inability, you know, now an academic is saying there's something they can't do, and that is communicate with the public. So mm -hmm. you have ideas that you really believe are important for humanity, but how do you develop a skill set to communicate with the world? And for me... That was the challenge. So I could mm -hmm. write, I could write science papers. And well, did very well with that. And when I tried to do some books based on the science papers, they were like science papers in hardcover. So they still had the same problem. But fortunately, I have this remarkable son who has mm -hmm. a, a, he's a journalist by training and a filmmaker now. So actually, I'm going to give it to Seth, who uh, engaged <laughs> me in terms of the discussion. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, what he, what he said, you know, like, like there's been many tomes written about polyvagal theory, many of them by Dr. Porges here himself. But for the most part, they're largely uh, impenetrable. They're opaque, they're academic, they're hard to understand, they're hard to understand for, for anybody. And they kind of take on this, I think, almost like mystical Dead Sea Scroll quality where people are trying to interpret what his words mean, which is a lot of fun, or what does he mean by this? Because it's it's so, it's really hard to get, it's really hard to grasp. And I think he'll be the very first person to, mm -hmm. to say that. And, and, and the goal, which, you know, it was my specific goal kind of approaching him about this project was let's, let's write this. I think I understand how to tell this to people in a way mm -hmm. that makes sense, you know, just through years of dinner table osmosis. Right. And, and being a, a journalist at like mainstream magazines, like I, I think I know how to write this in a way that makes sense for people. And when mm -hmm. you break down polyvagal to its core, yes, there's a lot of heady academic stuff, just the hell of heady neuroscience, but really it's a simple and innate and relatable concept that I think catches on with people because they see it in their own lives. They feel in their own lives and they intuitively understand a lot of what it says. And the goal of this book also was to create something where if you just walked away reading the first 10 pages, you'd have something, you know, you'd walk away being able to understand a little bit enough to maybe help you and send you on your own journey. And, you know, we, 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 
like I think the very first page of the book, we just kind of like summarize, here's everything you need to know in one sentence. You can throw away the rest of the book, but all you need to know is really, really simple. If somebody asks you, what is polyvagal theory? If you're asking yourself, what is polyvagal theory? It's really, really, really simple. Polyvagal theory is just the idea that how safe we feel, our body feels, is crucial to both our mental and physical health and happiness and ability to live a good life. Mm -hmm. It's really that simple. But polyvagal theory is about is about how our bodies, our nervous systems, our brains, our ability to experience the world transforms with the level of safety that our body feels. And I think mm -hmm. we all innately understand this when you ask people about things like fight or flight. When we feel threatened, different bodily systems turn on that allow you to mm -hmm. fight or flee or you know, kick butt or do whatever else you have to do. And I think people, most people's understanding of how our bodies change via safety kind of ends there. What polyvagal theory kind of dives into is all the other ways our bodies change, both for defense in order to deal with moments of threat, but also for safety. And this is key because only when our bodies feel safe are they able to turn on the systems that allow for health, growth, and restoration. Mm -hmm. And those are obviously just crucial for our health, for our ability, to, our sanity, our ability to live a good life. Yeah. When thinking about that, and another quote that stood out to me was this idea that you know, and this is from you know, page 14 in the book, our physiological state and how we feel are intervening variables and how we experience the world and can change just about everything related to our experience of being alive. And you talk about in the book too, of that, depending on the state you're in, it's kind of, if you're in that kind of green state, yellow state or red state, it shifts all perspective as to what you're picking up, what you're perceiving, what you're kind of in a way ignoring, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's so powerful because when you start to, as a clinician, when I work with individuals with trauma and other histories, whether attachment wounds, when they're stuck in these states, you really see how our perspectives shift drastically depending on where are we. I mean, if you've ever encountered a dog, you've seen this, right? Yes. If you have a dog who's been abused or mm -hmm. at a pound or whatever else, they interpret everything around them as a threat. They will snarl mm -hmm. at you. They will bark at you even if you're trying to give them a treat. Mm -hmm. If you encounter a dog that feels safe, that's smiling, that's tails wagging, you can go right up to it and pet it. And it's the same action is being interpreted in different ways because that dog's nervous system is in a state of either safety or threat. Mm -hmm. And we actually come to dogs a lot in this book because I think it's such a clean yeah. example about how our, you know, we, we see it, we visualize it, we innately understand it, how dogs handle these things. And humans do the same way as well. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, yeah, you definitely, reading it when you use the dog analogy, it makes, it makes so much sense because I've had dogs growing up. And, and also, too, when you have like a maybe a really well-behaved, you know, safe dog who might get injured, right? How, when they're in that state, even if you're the owner, you have to, they could still kind of snip at you if they're like, if they like broke a leg or something because they're in pain and they might even nip at you because they're just trying to survive. Even if there's like a calm relationship with you and the dog until you come in and sue that they can still react sometimes. And I think that translates to us as humans as well. We could be really relatively calm and we could still get triggered in these states and maybe react in ways that we normally wouldn't based upon trying to survive. Yeah, and these are natural responses. They're things that happen to everybody. I think oftentimes, you know, if you come into contact with with a loved one or somebody close to you who is in a highly reactive or defensive state, it can be tempting to kind of pass judgment on them or, you know, feel like this is a conscious act on their part. But I think what's crucial to understand is this is outside of our control. This is this is the body taking charge, right? Mm. This is not us deciding to be reactive. This is our nervous system making an assessment based on all the information around us, the experience we went through, our past experiences, and kind of choosing a lane about what is what bodily state, and this is really what it comes down to. Your body is deciding what bodily state is most likely to allow me to survive, is what mm. this is. And yeah. if your body has been through a lot of trauma, if your body has been through a lot of experiences that make it predisposed to feel like there could be danger lurking at any moment, it, it can be, you know, you can you can be in these states a lot more than you would like to be. And mm. this is this is this is the, the none of these states are in there's no morality behind this. There's nothing wrong with these states. The problems for us comes when we're in these states that are designed for short term survival, when we're in them all the time. And I think mm. that's endemic in today's modern society where traffic and deadlines and phone vibrations and, yeah. you know, TVs blaring at us and news headlines and all these things kind of trigger, 
these ancient neural pathways that were designed to put us into states of alert for short periods of time to survive a predator, to survive somebody trying to kill you. When mm -hmm. you're in them all the time, your body literally cannot funnel any resources towards the systems that allow it for health, growth, and restoration. And on top of that, your sensory experience changes. You know, mm -hmm. the way things smell, sound, hear, all these things change. So when you're in a state of defense, things you liked, you know, they don't hit you the same way. It's hard to enjoy the world. It's hard to engage people socially. It's hard mm -hmm. to think critically and independently. It's just kind of hard to live your best life. Yeah. And with that said, you, you answered the, this is kind of a twofer, but you answered the why, the, the, like kind of part one or part A why is we wrote the book to take this heady, and I've read some of that, it is, it's, it's more in-depth and takes a lot longer to, to read. It reads more woody, it reads like a science book, and I've read some of it. You answered the part A, why is we need to make something more accessible, and I think that's always a, like Dr. Poor just said, is a challenge of taking this big concept and making it accessible so anyone could read it and, ex and use it in their you know day-to-day -day life. So the second part of why, like part B, would be, well, why should we care about this? Well, yeah, I'll start on that one because when I created the theory, when I, I basically wrote the initial paper, it was a science question. It was an explanation of a clinical issue in basically with high risk preterm babies. Why did certain heart rate patterns represent a threat while other heart rate patterns? What were the mechanisms that were protected? And this was through the vagus. And there's a lot of hype on the vagus these days. And this is why polyvagal, meaning different vagal pathways. So it was explanatory. But I, when I wrote the papers and started to give talks about it, I did not anticipate the welcoming reception in the world of trauma. And this to me was literally transformative for me and functionally has been transformative for the community because they taught me that they, those who had been traumatized were experiencing this dissociative shutting down behaviors in their intentional mind, they want to be social, they want to embrace, they want to have relationships, but something happens when they get in proximity with another, their body says no. So I often say that I learn what it is to be a human from those who have experienced severe trauma. They taught me what they lost, and it had nothing to do with their visualization, their expectation, their intentionality. It had to deal with their body interpreting and detecting social cues as threat to their body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to jump on what you're saying because I, I think you know the, the question he's asking is why, why, why do, why do it say, why should I care about this? And mm -hmm. it, I think it's 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 really simple. We are all humans. We are all struggling to get through this anxious and stressful world that is throwing a never-ending gauntlet of challenges at us. We all kind of feel like we're drowning sometimes, like we're underwater, like we're overwhelmed. Everybody, it's, it's a universal experience. Mm. And we all experience the effects of that. We feel the stress hormones, we feel uh, the panic, we feel all of these things. And I think we all mm. seek answers to understand what is going on here? What is this doing to our body? And is there another way to live our life? Uh, what polyvagal theory offers is an explanation for what the world around us does to our bodies. And we all live in, we all have bodies, we all live in the world around us, right? And on, through understanding that, you you can do simple things to both give yourself permission to feel and to live and to not feel like you're doing something wrong, honestly, mm -hmm. just by feeling overwhelmed. But also you can do, you can make changes, you can do things differently, right? You know, polyvagal theory teaches us mm -hmm. that it is important to prioritize feelings of safety. We live in a world that I think is dismissive of that, is dismissive of the idea that our feelings even matter in any way whatsoever, right? And what Polyvagal tells us is this matters. Our feelings matter. Our feelings are tied to our health. Our feelings are tied to our sanity. Our feelings are tied to our abilities to, you know, just for the focus of your podcast, to be good fathers, to be good family members, to take care of other people. When the key takeaways from polyvagal theory is how social behavior, you know, there's a lot of stuff on social media, on TikTok about the vagus nerve and how mm -hmm. activating it kind of should give you some magical healing powers and all that. Those hacks are great. What polyvagal theory says is really the cleanest, simplest, most effective way of activating the vagus nerve is just being social with people who make you feel safe. What mm -hmm. polyvagal theory does is it ties social behavior itself to the health of our body. And it kind of, you know, it goes back looking at the evolution of social behavior and says that social behavior itself evolved 
as a way for us to both project and receive signs of safety from people around us, from those around us, so that our bodies knew that they could kind of shut down their defense systems and allow themselves to heal. And once you kind of really grok what that is implying, what that means, you begin to look around you and realize that our desire for social behavior, our need for social behavior is nothing less, I think, than the cornerstone of almost every system humanity has ever built. It's why we have cities. It's why we have so many institutions. It's why we like parties. It's why we like hanging out with friends. It's why we like being around people who make us feel good, right? Mm. And understanding that it's healthy. It is, it is healthful. It is healing to be in safe social interactions. And when you grow up in a world like I did in the 80s and 90s, where social behavior and parties and things like that are viewed as like frivolous or unimportant or whatever it is, and you realize, actually, this is kind of the most important thing, is putting yourself in these scenarios where you're around people who make you feel safe and who you can allow to feel safe as well. Yeah. yeah. Let me kind of add to that. We, we have basically have a society that has always treated bodily feelings or emotional feelings as optional. And we want to really emphasize that feeling safe is obligatory for our nervous system, and it knows mm. it. And these feelings of safety are really a reflection of whether the nervous system is regulating our internal organs to support health growth and restoration, or what's called homeostatic functions. So when we disrupt that neuroregulation, our physiology triggers feelings of lack of safety, feelings of threat. And we call we use words like anxiety or stress. So we mm. overlay and make it more complicated. All we need to say is, wow, my body is it's disrupting its homeostatic function, and that's mm. not good. My body yeah. for health, growth, and restoration, my body needs to calm down. And when you the model, we can start thinking of this is when a baby is crying, why does the mother calm the baby? If someone is ill, why do we use terms like relax, calm down, it will be better for you if you relax. Because this mobilization, the fight-flight behavior in defense gets in the way, it turns off the nervous system's regulation of the organs. I want to make one final, basically repeat the emphasis that Seth made. I talk about health growth and restoration as homeostatic processes or functions, but I also add to its sociality as a homeostatic process. But it creates a circularity because not only does it emerge when our body is in this more homeostatic way, but it supports the homeostatic function. So the, the loop or the loop becomes co-regulation. Yeah, everything's everything's co, uh, self, you know, these are all, there's so many loops here. It's yeah. everything, you know, it, you, your body, when your body, again, going back to what we are talking about before about like dogs, right? When mm -hmm. a dog or a human is in a state of defense, it's all of its sensory inputs, the position of its middle ear muscles, what sounds it's here, it's pupil, everything shifts to mm. so that it is biased towards interpreting everything around it as a threat, which mm. makes it ever harder to kind of break through. And so once you begin to realize that you see like the, the changes that occur when we feel safe, we are more predisposed to pick up other signs of safety and to mm. see those and everything around us as safe. When we feel threatened, we are predisposed to pick up signs of threat and to see things around us as threats. And so the, the, the impetus becomes, it becomes harder. And when you look at people with trauma histories who might be by nature, almost definitionally predisposed to see things as threats just because of what they've been through, you begin to realize why it can be so difficult to make them feel safe mm. and how important it is to make them mm. feel safe at the same time. The, the and, complicated factor in this, I'm now going to reflect to the fathering aspect uh, of the, your audience, also my fathering uh, history with my my sons, and that is the great expectation that the responsibility for regulation relies with the child. And so we use the word self-regulation or get yourself together, regulate your behavior, when in reality, you can't do that. The mm -hmm. We are, we evolve as a nerve, we have a nervous system that really looks for co-regulation, signals of safety from others to enable our bodies to give up its defenses. So yelling at a child who is in a physiological state of threat or defensiveness to begin with is confirming to their nervous system that they're under threat. Mm. So we want to really uh, give them signals of safety so that their bodies calm and then they can regulate. But in reality, we are a major uh, component of their co-regulatory skill set. So think of the crying baby and the mother using the intonation of her voice. She's not yelling at the baby to say, stop crying. She's sending in her prosodic intonation of voice 
signals of safety that the baby's nervous system unambiguously understands. Think about how you talk to your dogs. Do you yell at your dogs? You do the same thing. So this whole notion is that we have portals that our nervous system has to detect signals of safety. And that's something we should really emphasize in our social life, in our educational life, in our clinical care, whether you're talking about mental health care or going to a physician's office. How many people feel safe and comfortable in a medical environment? How many feel safe and comfortable in a hospital? Or a school or any of these environments. And and this is really important because in our brains, the cranial processes that require that are required for us to think creatively, independently, productively, to be, you know, smart people, to come up with ideas, to do all these things that society asks of us, it's much, much more difficult to access yeah. those cranial functions when your body is under threat because all of its resources, all of your body's resources are being pushed towards immediate survival, not solving problems in any real deep creative sense. Yeah. And so creativity, these things that yeah. that we seek out as people, right, and society yeah. seeks from us, they basically require us to feel safe. And we kind of think about that and the way we design, we have chapters on this in the book, but the way we design schools, mm. where we design hospitals, workplaces, all of these institutions, and just the, the sensory experience of being in them and what that does to our body. If you're in a school where you're passing through a metal detector and there's guards with guns, or you're packed in with 100 screaming people, you know, your body's not going to feel safe, especially if it's the body of a child that's predisposed towards seeking danger, towards finding danger in this world, if they come from a perhaps an abusive household, or just a dangerous neighborhood, you know, mm -hmm. or an environmentally damaged neighborhood, you know, their bodies might be predisposed to feel unsafe, they were put into this environment that's already overwhelming from a mm -hmm. sensory point of view, the cards are stacked against them. Yeah, and I would maybe say, would you be safe to see even a kid coming from a safe home who might who might have a neurodivergent brain? Could also yeah, there's some there's all of sorts of, of reasons a body could be predisposed to uh, towards towards threat in this world. Some biological, some environmental, some you know it's a big cocktail of nature and nurture yeah. going on in there, right? Oh, for sure. And and absolutely, and you know there are people who you know you've all I'll go back to dogs here. You know, you might have a litter of dogs with like seven or eight dogs, and some of them are just naturally very social and friendly, mm -hmm. and some are scared cowering in the corner, right? Mm -hmm. there, there's there's innateness to this as well. Mm -hmm. And and I think that that demands of us empathy and sympathy once you begin to realize that. I, I'm going to introduce another concept. So during the past, actually in the past year, we adopted a, a cat. And we had cats when when our boys were young, but not as when they were gone. We had just had dogs. And dogs are like children. They require the interaction, co-regulation. They look for, at your face. They listen to your voice. Mm. A cat is very different. And I had to get, is said, relearn what it is to be part of a cat's world. In the cat's world, the cat is using you as a co-regulator. You are not using the cat as your co-regulator. It's all on, on the terms of the cat. So our cat likes to be in proximity with us. And when she doesn't want to be touched, she walks away, but she's in eye. She's still maintaining visual contact. So mm. she, her whole life is about regulating physiological state. So cats spend a lot of time cat napping or light sleeping, but they're not really deep sleeping. They know when you're walking around, they detect that. And they're looking for it as a way of feeling safe enough to give up their defenses. And it's really interesting to watch her cat go on her back and put her paws out like this without yeah. any uh, fear of being touched. And you totally understand that her life's goal is to feel safe enough to give up her defenses. And she is in, in a journey of co-regulating with us, but my needs for her to co-regulate me don't take the highest priority in her life, but they do it with dogs. Dogs are really, they were bred and evolved as a co-evolutionary process with humans mm -hmm. to help them regulate and feel safe. Mm -hmm. Basically, they became the vigilance while mm -hmm. in, humans could now go to sleep at night, the dog could, could watch. Mm -hmm. But it's very interesting to take this notion of co-regulation and see the two different uh, strategies, a dog, human one, versus a cat one. They're still co-regulatory. They want cues that their nervous system interprets to be safe. And now I start to suggest that maybe we should look at our children more like cats than, 
dogs. That's, that's we, a good image. Would be, well, I'm saying maybe we should be more accepting and yeah. less demanding. So we start understanding that they are using us to regulate themselves. And maybe we should kind of dismiss the fact that we have been using them to regulate us. Yeah, I like it. That concept shifts because I grew up both with cats and dogs as well, and you see the difference. Very different. Pepsi was our cat, who that was later was called. Was Coke your dog? No, no. Ta- Tasha was our dog. She was a Rottweiler. Great dog, by the way. And Pepsi was. They had fun together. But yeah, it's funny because cats they don't want. They either want to do with you or they don't. Right, and they choose. Yeah. It's like they they want to play. Their terms. They don't want yeah. to. Had enough of that. Yeah. I'm walking away. Yeah, it's like, I'm good. And they would always, always, you're right, always with an eye shot, ear shot. They'd always be in a spot that they can yeah. pick up. But a um, couple things that you mentioned, I want to go back to that I think to hear from you both on this, we said, you know, trauma, right? And I think that's such a big term that's tossed around the interweb, social media, TikTok, Instagram. So could we, according to polyvagal theory, what, what, how would we define trauma through that lens? Okay, I will, I'll start. Basically, uh, the word trauma is, uh, creates tremendous ambiguity because we are a very event-oriented culture. So we think trauma is linked to an event and the event itself causes the trauma. And now we are literally disrespecting the resilience of certain nervous systems who can literally pass through these traumatic events without trauma. And if someone then is traumatized by something that most people aren't, we start saying, I got through that, you know, what about you? The issue is we need to shift the emphasis to how the body reacted. So when we use the word trauma, trauma is really the body's reaction to an event or to a context. And if that reaction is a retuning of the autonomic nervous system, meaning moving it from its resilient states of calmness and homeostasis to now states that support defense, that's trauma. Mm. Yeah, I'll, I'll build on that and say that, you know, as he was saying, it's not the, the problem with defining it by the event itself is that any number of people can experience the exact same event and their nervous systems will come out differently. There are some people who can experience a hor- horrible event and uh, walk away without much impact on them. And there's other people who it can severely impact. And it's important to know that because I think oftentimes we judge people's trauma based on how severe we assume the event to be, not understanding that it really has nothing to do with it. It's just what what does the nervous system take away from it? And from there, I'll kind of build on a definition of trauma to say that the way I view it, and trauma is such a big, broad, ambiguous word that means so many things. And a million people can offer different and no less accurate definitions of what it is. But to me, it's it's when an event changes the goalposts for our ability to feel safe, is what I think it is. You know, it's when you go through something and because of that event, our nervous system is now more inclined to find threat and danger in the world around us. And the implications for that are can be massive. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think that's through my training, through the Institute and some other trainings in trauma, you know, I think Dr. Dan Siegel said that's anything that overwhelms our current capacity to cope. I think mm, a, yeah. a quote he said about trauma, and when you start to think of it through or the lens of polyvagal or that, you really see that it is so different, that you could have 10 people experience the same event, and you have eight that walk away fine, you have two that are have could have you know post-traumatic stress, and I'd say response versus a disorder, because that's a whole other topic of conversation with disorders in the medical profession and how we could change things through the nervous system, and, and I like how, how, how we approach kind of these adaptive responses and how you guys even talk about addiction and things in here that... It really is about our way of trying to regulate our nervous system as best mm-hmm. we can with survival, um, rather than this being this quote unquote disorder that's that's um, stigmatizing. And so this this idea of trauma, and then if we think of that of maybe you know how we've been raised in schools, if you're in a school that's chaotic and environment, and these kids or a home that has maybe parents that aren't attuned or parents that aren't engaged with them emotionally or yelling a lot and um, you know just stop and just feel you know don't cry things like that. Often when I'm thinking of some general ways that men have been socialized around this is stop crying. Don't, you know, don't be a baby. Don't be a girl, you know, pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Don't feel, you're not supposed to feel sad, no crying. And so you have these boys and we'll focus on this for a second, boys that are raised in the environment, you know, every day told these messages. And so as you think of it, a boy's raising that from childhood, adolescence, and they're, you know, playing sports, and then sports have certain rules around them. So generally speaking, when he becomes in a father or an adult, a man, you know, he has, I would maybe posit or argue he's got certain 
survival mechanisms around certain emotions and feelings. So I'm thinking of a father who might be then seeing a kid, his son or daughter, having a big emotion, maybe crying or having a quote-unquote tantrum or a behavioral problem, which is really them being dysregulated. And then his first response is to like, no, stop, you know, kind of yeah. don't Discipline. feel, go to your room, yeah. just punitive punishment to not feel. And, and, and he's kind of repeating it. So if we're, you know, and it's a quick little case study, but if we were looking at that kind of typical guy, what do we think might be going on from a polyvagal perspective of what's happening in this father who's now seeing his kid being dysregulated, now he's yelling? There are multiple things going on here. First of all, let's talk about the father, what's going on inside of him. And what he's trying to teach his child is to not listen to the feedback that his body's giving him. So he's saying you, you basically he's trying to make use this term that feelings are optional. They're not obligatory. Now, what does that do on a neurophysiological level? It starts to turn off the feedback mechanisms, and that meaning that we start losing the sensations of our body, of our internal organs, and that leads to illness because the feedback loops, basically we're turning off the nervous system regulation of our visceral organs. And you find out that many people who suffer from chronic stress, severe anxiety or trauma, this whole package of people have literally predictable symptoms in terms mm -hmm. of physiological problems. And they often get clustered into an area which is called uh, functional disorders or medically unexplained symptoms, meaning that they have problems, but they don't have an identifiable pathology when the organ is being evaluated. And that's because medicine looks at end organ function and doesn't look at neural regulation of that organ. So when you dampen the feedback loops, you're in a sense interfering with how that organ is being regulated by the nervous system and the brain, which means whether it's being maintained in a sense a healthful way. Another way of thinking about it is disrupt the homeostasis or disrupt the neural feedback to the organ and over time that organ will become diseased add on to that too i think i think that you know look again looking at the father's experience they were they are passing on their own learned experience that showing these emotions would have been interpreted as weakness and make them less safe right if they are going to get bullied if they're going to get beaten if they're going to get yelled at for showing these emotions their body is going to associate those emotions mm -hmm. with with threat with danger mm -hmm. and so they're passing on that information even if the world around them has changed even if now maybe it's okay to cry if it's okay to have feelings and in fact necessary for our own health and survival they're mm -hmm. passing on this this information that to do so is to show weakness and to put yourself into a threat to you know and to compromise your own safety. And of course, the problem with that is that gives your body no space, no room to ever uh, reach the level of vulnerability that's required for it to turn off its defense systems so as to heal, grow, and restore. And it's just damaging to the body as a result. Yeah, you know, well, you know, I didn't always have polyvagal theory, especially I didn't always have it when I was parenting or fathering my, my sons. Uh, but the issue is I had to learn because I mm. grew up with the notion of you better get control over your own behavior for your own good because you don't want to be targeted. You don't want to uh, you want to navigate through a complex world and mm. you can hear the cues of how or let's say the the instructions of how to navigate. And you better learn that because if you can't navigate, you're going to be victimized. Mm. And it doesn't always work that way because it's not a top down. It's not intentionality. Mm. So I kind of, you know, my classical training in psychology was, well, rewards, punishments, the typical thing. It wasn't until Seth was about 12 that I really started to embrace polyvagal theory and started to see it in terms of parenting behavior and started to reinterpret my, ch my children's responses from a polyvagal perspective. And I start to reinterpret my, my father, who was still, actually my mother was alive at that time too. I start to reinterpret their behaviors and my sister's behavior. I start to interpret things by understanding that a lot of the behavior was being driven by physiological state that had nothing to do with intentionality. And this mm. concept that we start to interpret and make meaning out of people's behavior, creating causality, justification, and, and it's a supporting narratives that are really irrelevant, it creates the problems within families and it creates the problems within society. That yeah. we have to understand. I think Seth's done a real good job. You can hear him as he talks about this. And Seth is really the primary voice of the book. That Seth enables this communication that there's two separate things going on. There's intentionality, 
which is our conscious, intentional brain. And then there's a brainstem lower historically through evolution, older circuits that are survival oriented, but they're not of equal power. Mm-hmm. And our society assumes that the intentional, the new brain, the mammalian, the, the neocortex runs the whole world. Forget it. It's the primitive lower brainstem that if it gets a signals of threat, it runs the world. And we can yeah. see that literally in our politics in this country now. We can see it going on in the world that if you sow signals of chaos and threat, what's the physiology of the people in it and what's their acceptance of other? There's a big price to pay. We are a social nervous system. We are a benevolent, compassionate, functionally trusting and loving species. But we yeah. can only be that way when our physiology is calm. Once yeah. that we feel comes, safe, we yeah. feel safe. If right. that physiology yeah. gets triggered into threat, we are proximal. We want to take care of ourselves and those closest to us. Yeah. And we that- can be a smiling golden retriever or a snarling, you know, I don't want to hate on Rottweilers, but that's the image coming to my head right now. <laughs> you know, you can be, uh, you can be, we're, they're, they're both, we are capable of both. Yeah, but and Seth, I think, you, Seth, go yeah. back and talk about Frosty. We had a marvelous dog when, when Seth and his brother Eric were growing up, and it, it would allow, uh, the two of them to do anything. They could wrestle with them or anything. But a stranger, someone who was not part of the family, if they mm. got off the couch, it was mm. really uh, dangerous for that person. Yeah. yeah. So it was the pack, right? You were part of the pack in safety. Oh, suppose so. Yeah. yeah, yeah oh, very there. much so. I watched the kids playing with him. And I also watched him because uh, he was such a, an attractive dog. People wouldn't believe that he was mm. so, mm. quote, family mm. oriented. That's the magic word mm. when they describe <laughs> breeds. Yeah. Uh, but it was really quite amazing, this little cute dog. If you got off the couch and you were a stranger, you were a threat. You were a threat yeah. to everyone in the family. But if you're in the family, ah, pick me up, throw me around. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that earned trust. Well, and going back to what you said, I think with this father, because I, I see reading research articles on men and, and all this stuff. I've read a lot of research on this and obviously on every article. But I have a big heart and passion to help men and fathers. And going back to this notion of the, the Kasich study we gave of this dad who was raised in a home of socialized around, you know, lack of vulnerability, emotions aren't safe. And so in a way, what I would see is in his nervous system, it really is emotions really are a threat to his nervous system. This is what I, how I am I conceptualizing it. So if it's a threat, he's going to go into survival, which is why he might get angry or, or my, he might also numb out and shut down and walk away. I'm going to actually make you clarify some statements. Because you said when someone gets emotional, what you really mean, they're sending signals of dysregulation or which is interpreted by his nervous system as signals of threat. So let's say it's a kind of a binary decision. The emotion is positive, it's welcoming, and it it basically signals a hug or a smile versus it's something that your nervous system reacts to as you don't want it. You want it out of your world. Right. And, And that's what he's doing. So he's triggered in a state of threat. The real issue on the on the clinical model is, does he feel his own body? And this becomes the first question. And that is, if he's brought up in a certain way, he becomes numb to his own body. And yes. part of the therapeutic strategy is, before he reacts to his child, can he identify how he feels? And I would say with that, most of the men and women I've worked with in this is that they are very disconnected from their bodily state. It's very... It's it's head intellect down, and they mm. don't really know what's going on. When I ask, often get bl- initially when I'm working with them, there's a lot of blank stares of like, I, and a lot of I don't know. Almost like it's it's very separate, as if if it doesn't exist. They don't. It's all here and like head head it, and like everything else below is like I don't <laughs> initially I don't know. So I see that. Well, well, the fact that they can acknowledge that they don't know is really a good sign, yeah. uh, and and things that can start really is like. Do you feel different when you exhale slowly? Can you feel your body a little? Now, these feelings are going to be threatening to them because they are going to be, the feelings of calmness is a signal of vulnerability. So this is the paradox when you come out of that type of developmental experience that your body doesn't welcome signals of safety because Mm. signals of safety are where we are talking about lovelies, it's accessibility to their nervous system, it's vulnerability. 
and they don't want to allow that to occur. I think what you're doing here in this book as well, and just the whole theory itself, is really integrating the how important listening and paying attention to our body, the cues of our body, are saying to us, and almost learning the language of our body. Right? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. You know, the book the book begins with a chapter on just like defining what the autonomic nervous system is, and I think that's a term we all here but it's you know if i'm in a room and i ask people who can actually define it you see very few hands go up and i think that's really important because what the autonomic nervous system is of course autonomic the word basically means automatic it's the parts of our body that operate outside our conscious control which is the vast majority of our body influencing everything you know if we we can't we don't consciously ask our heart to beat we don't consciously ask our sweat glands to sweat these things just sort of happen under the hood outside of our control consciousness can control a very, very, very small percentage of our bodily functions. And once you begin to realize how much of our body is just sort of ticking along and driven by the autonomic nervous system and how being in a state of safety or a state of threat changes how all of those bodily functions operate, you begin to realize just what's actually going on in our body and how you know little of it is consciously controlled and how important it is to listen to those parts that are taking along outside of our conscious control because they matter. And, and it's that kind of conscious unconscious is, and that's I think tuning into the body like what's happening physically, physiologically noticing it and almost like practicing paying attention to what's happening in your body to like bring that unconscious to the conscious awareness, which I think does take practice, especially if you're used to kind of tuning out part of yourself to survive. And, and I think of what you guys were mentioning earlier is this idea of how we are social beings for co-regulation, how we are, we need that. And you mentioned in the book quite a few times, face-to-face -face contact, like in person, and how yeah. important that is. And I think of a lot of men that I work with, and i.e. fathers as well, is how off, how, especially when they're coming in and they're really struggling, how more often than not, how disconnected they are from relationships outside of their initial home, and yeah. how... They don't have a lot of face-to-face, -face, relational, safe contact in that way. Yeah. Again, like face-to-face, -face, you know, through the vast, vast majority of human existence, the only way to have social contact was through face-to-face -face interaction. Internet is, you know, a very new thing. The phone, from in the grand scheme of things, is very new. The written letter, in the grand scheme of things, is very, very new. 99.9% .9 of human homo sapien existence, the only way to communicate with somebody was face to face. Mm. And so that is how our nervous system sort of baked in the the idea of social interaction into our bodies, the idea that we as species were more likely to survive if we had safe social interactions, so we could defend each other, team up with each other, uh, have each other's backs, go to sleep while somebody else is on guard, raise children together, do all of these things that as a social species, we evolved to do, you know, our bodies uh, evolved to compel us to have social interaction. Mm -hmm. But how does our body clock that we're actually social interaction, we're actually kind of fulfilling this handshake, this ancient contract, this need for social interaction, it's through face to face interaction. And it's through very, very specifically the activation of the muscles and the nerves that allow us to control our voice, our face, our shoulders, all of these things that, that are involved with actual in-person social interaction. Those, those cranial nerves and those muscles, they actually plug into the same part of the brainstem as the vagus nerve that is activated when we feel safe. So there's a system that Dr. Port just calls the social engagement system that is activated when we feel safe through the vagus nerve that turns on effectively the cranial nerves and the muscles that allow us to be expressive in a facial way, in a vocal mm -hmm. way with people around us. And so these behaviors are intrinsically tied in a kind of bi-directional way with us feeling safe. So when we feel safe, we're better able to socialize. And when we socialize, we're better able to feel safe. And it goes back and forth and back and forth. You have to think about it from the evolution of a non-verbal species, but species that vocalize. How does a species communicate to another conspecific of the same species that they're safe enough to come close to? They would do it through vocalization. And mm -hmm. with primates, especially humans, is facial expressivity and intonation of voice. That it's not the words we use, it's our facial expressivity and the intonation of voice that triggers or signals the nervous system that we can be approached. So we have to think about the fact that we are broadcasting our autonomic state in our voice and in our facial expression. And 
our physiological state also interferes or gives permission for uh, basically our auditory system and the middle ear structures to filter out background sounds and pull in human voice. So we could be, at least when you're younger, we could be in a bar talking to someone, smiling, engaging, and hear every word they're saying with lots of background noise. But as we get older, or if you have a, let's say, a history of trauma history or stress, chronic stress history, you might find environments like restaurants and shopping malls overwhelming you. Let me let me translate what he's saying a little bit here. Yeah. So we talked before about how our sensory experience changes based on how safe we feel or perhaps are having a trauma history. What he's talking about specifically are there are middle ear, tiny muscles in our middle ear, the smallest muscles in the entire body. And their job is to manipulate the eardrum to effectively act as a filter so that we can better pick up the sounds of sociability, the sounds of human speech. Um, I don't think it's a surprise to, to say to anybody that the sounds of human speech are very special to our brain. We pick them up. We can hear words from people in loud and crowded bars or music venues quite well often. But that's only true when we feel safe. These middle ear muscles transform when we're in a state of threat, and they change how your eardrum's tautness so that instead of being primed to pick up the middle frequencies of human speech, you're better able to pick up, say, ultra low frequencies of a predator. Because when your body feels threatened, it doesn't want to hear people talk. It wants to be on the lookout, on alertness for something that might hurt it. And so mm-hmm. as humans are, you know, the sounds of human speech are very special to us, but only when we feel safe. And and if you say, never feel safe, as is the case with, you know, people who may have suffered trauma, or have uh, just different, you know, neurologies, you know, you might have a different audiology signal. I think we all kind of understand that a huge percentage of people with PTSD, folks who come back from war, for example, have difficulty dealing with loud and crowded environments that that loud noises might scare them or frighten them or cause an instinctive emotional reaction. That's sort of a Mm. trope in movies. The fact mm-hmm. that that happens, right? We see that all the time in television shows. You go to a place and those loud sounds are, are very overwhelming. Well, this is true. And it's a physiological shift that occurs. It's a change in our middle ear muscles that happens when our bodies feel threatened. It mm-hmm. changes the sounds we pick up. And so oftentimes we treat trauma as if it's a purely psychiatric or psychological issue, mm-hmm. something that should be dealt exclusively with, with say, talk therapy or medication. But in fact, it's a physiological phenomenon. It changes the way our body and organs and systems operate down to what sounds we pick up in the world around us. Which really changes and revolutionizes everything when you think about it that yes. way. That it, it really shifts away from, I think, a one-dimensional viewpoint of how why we might have an anxiety disorder or depression or trauma or you know, chronic stress or some of these, other, you know, disorders I'm putting in quote. Sure. That when you look at it from a, this kind of polyvagal lens, you could see actually it's it's a, it's this adaptive response to dealing with it, but it could also get stuck. It's like a stuck state, I would say, right? If we're in depression, Absolutely. we're stuck in that kind of red zone. So I got to survive. So I got to shut everything down. Or like, like play possum, play dead to, to figure mm-hmm. it out and immobilize to, to like don't do anything. And so I get, and then I get stuck. And then if I'm stuck there long enough, it could have negative impacts on my life. And this is, and it's so important to understand that because I think oftentimes these often unexplainable bodily phenomenons that occur when people are traumatized or threatened, where suddenly they have auditory processing issues, which again, are extremely common with people with a trauma history, they might have digestion issues, extremely common with people with a trauma history, all sorts of bodily changes that their therapist or their doctor is unable to explain. That Mm -hmm. inability to explain creates confusion, it creates mystery, it creates shame, it oftentimes creates doubt, and it creates the feeling that people might think there's something wrong with me, or what I'm feeling is unique or unnatural, when in fact it's an exceedingly common and exceedingly natural response to whatever it is they've been through. And just understanding that, I think, is so, so important because... I mean, shame is dangerous, right? Like it causes so many problems when people feel like there's no explanation for what's happening to them. And understanding that what they're dealing with is natural and expected, I think gives people permission to feel those things outside of shame. At least I hope it does. Let me just add one point to that is the ability to feel, to have those feelings isn't wrong in itself. It's the narrative that we put on top of it. 
So we have to understand that our body is going to react in a very it's a heroic way to make to in sense enhance our survival. But our narrative is really where we get into trouble, where we start to explain things, and it creates a lot of problems. So we want to in a sense embrace the awareness of our own bodily feelings before we create the narrative of why mm -hmm. we are have those feelings and why we're entitled to be angry at that person or yeah. hostile in this environment. Yeah. You mentioned in the book too this I, these different aspects of maybe being under chronic stress. I'm, I'm using that word loosely here for the sake of this this point. You know, you, you have this whole piece on the workplace and how we're so tied to our phone and going off and how that could you know we're activated. I work with a lot of people that have you know the first thing they do is they look at their phone or they're they're tied yeah. to their phone and work emails or they go to bed and and they wake up. And I, you know, Travis, I wake up every day. I'm just already overwhelmed. I'm already stressed. I'm already you know, I'm already tired. I'm, I'm exhausted. I don't have all this stuff. And, and they, they're so tied to this thing and their work. It's not necessarily their fault, but it's like, can you speak more about that, that we live in this world that is, while a positive of being interconnected with media and everything, but maybe the possible downside of this? We're aliens in a world. We evolved for one <laughs> planet. And the one we live in is one that's not only totally different. It's one that is oftentimes consciously designed to co-opt these ancient mechanisms mm -hmm. because the mechanisms of threat detection, the mechanisms of survival, those are mechanisms of engagement. Those are mechanisms of paying attention. Those are mechanisms that if you're an advertiser or a social media company or a news channel or all of these things, it's in your best interest to tap into them because, you know, we've all doom scrolled on Twitter or Facebook before. When we feel threatened, we can't stop staring, right? And yeah. so and so it's not just that we exist now in a world that's very different from the one that our bodies evolved to exist in. We exist in one that is engineered, whether consciously or just through trial and error, engineered into co-opting and taking advantage of these mechanisms because mm -hmm. those mechanisms give, you know, they, are, they give people something from us that they want. Mm. Yeah, I want to build on that. There were these movies. I think there's a trilogy of the Matrix movies. Mm. And I'm going to say basically they got it partially right. But what is the Matrix? It's threat cues being bombarded 24 7. Mm. And that's yeah. the making of who we are. And mm. our nervous system will respond. It prioritizes threat cues, but it really is on a quest for cues of safety. Mm. Yeah. And we, you know, outrage and anger are extremely easy to manufacture, it's very easy. To make somebody feel scared. And when we feel scared, when we feel threatened, again, our ability to access certain cranial functions disappears in, in favor of immediate survival. We stop asking questions. There's a reason every authoritarian history, every dictatorship in history has relied on scaring the populace. Because when people are scared, they're willing to do almost anything if somebody promises to alleviate that threat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's even emphasize that if you're frightened, it limits the creativity and problem solving ability of the population. Yeah. 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 It narrows the view. Narrows the field. It absolutely exactly. does. Because there's no time to think when you're just like, I'm going to die right now. And if you can make somebody feel overwhelmed. And I think if you're going to be cynical about this, I'm not, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to be very cynical, you're going to you begin to realize that maybe some people benefit if people uh, are hungry, uh, don't have adequate needs met, if their bodies are constantly in a state of threat, mm -hmm. in a state of fear, in a state of being overwhelmed, it becomes maybe less of a bug than a feature for some folks. You, well, under, you can understand why many employers, especially at low-wage hourly jobs, might intentionally want to keep their employees stressed out because well, they can kind of control the, them. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. Seth, it's not just piecework peace work, uh, employees. It's also academics. The academic, <laughs> the academic environment is a 24-7 evaluation mm -hmm. model, and it's never enough. It's more mm. publications, it's more grant money, it's it's fear of influence. Leveraging, it's never saying you've done a good job, smile mm. and, and take a week off and enjoy yourself. Think about things that you wanted to think about. It's no, there's a next grant proposal has to be another deadline and it's chronic. And, mm. and the environment for all these professions that used to have kind of a I want to say almost a, a monk-like environment where you were is it safe enough to explore the world on your own terms. They don't exist now because everything in our culture is really monetized and the bottom line for both research and for scientific inqu inquiry is not just solving problems. It's whether you can generate the funds to solve the problem. 
So mm-hmm. it's a complicated world we're in that is really quite pragmatic, that gets in the way of many of the positive attributes of our species, which is when we are safe enough, and I use the word enough, we become this wonderful, creative, exploratory, compassionate, benevolent, trusting species. And we have to know what is enough for us to function. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that 24-7 has to be safe. It just means we need enough safety for us to calm down and regulate our own physiology. Which allows for restoration, right, and healing and connection and everything else. And if we can ever get there, that leads to... Problems, it right? leads to burnout. You see it burnout. in all the professions. People are saying, I, you know, I'm burnt mm-hmm. out. It's an interesting journey when you see it through a different lens. And you say, well, can't we yeah. be smarter? We're, we're an intelligent species. Can't we structure a society that benefits our bodies as well? And you said something, Dr. Porges, this, and, and Seth, you mentioned it too, this idea of being a- enough and how we often work in systems that are always always wanting and demanding more typically and I'm generalizing yeah. here and that even if you get to that more you know they move the goalpost to the next more and so it's this constant yeah. what's well, not enough I gotta do more I gotta do more and even typically we get stuck in kind of keeping up with the Joneses of like well yeah. I gotta, well, you know, I gotta it can be as car. simple as accumulating wealth what's mm-hmm. enough yeah. We, yeah. What's we, enough? We that are, hamster wheel never we're, ends we're, you know <laughs> so if you're a billionaire well that's not enough you have to be a mega billionaire right. you know it's like Nothing is enough. And oh, are you gonna? Should I just quote Bruce Springsteen here? Was it a poor man want to be rich, rich man want to be king, and the king ain't satisfied till he rule everything? You know, and it's no, we we it's 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 a truth though that the 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 systems that we live in oftentimes don't really care about us and our health, mm. or they just don't understand what causes us and allows us to be healthy. Mm. I'm not trying to be like disparaging of everything around us. People just don't know. They don't, you know, we as a society, I think need to give ourselves permission to prioritize feelings of safety because mm. feelings of safety lead to health. Health mm. leads to happiness. Period. Yeah. Uh, we have and, and, to also prioritize what enough is enough for us. Yeah. Well, and that I think ties into a lot of shame messages here with a lot of people yeah. I've worked with is that I just don't, I feel like I'm not enough. I feel, I, I'm worthless. I feel like I have no value. I feel like yeah. who I am is unimportant. So we, they try ways to kind of fix that. And, but it's this constant fight for lack of a better word, or shutting down from, if they mm-hmm. can't, fix this belief system. And they feel it in their workplace. They can feel it in relationships with their parents and out in society. And so if we were to take this down to like a relational level, kind of coming, starting to land the plane for today's conversation, because a big theme throughout the entire book was that we are relational social beings that require kind of social, intimate, vulnerable contact. And so... How does that look? If we were to kind of take this and look practically in Dr. Porges and Seth and even your relationship of, okay, what does that look like in the day-to-day fighting these things of being enough or, you know, safety? How do we do this practically boots on the ground with relationships and how do you guys do that? Okay. I would like to say we, in our society, we've acknowledged that physical exercise is necessary, that we don't want to be sedentary, but we haven't really acknowledged that Social nourishment is a daily requirement as well. That means on some level, you know, interacting with people or even a Zoom. Uh, the pandemic really jolted our nervous systems because sociality became a signal of threat. Mm-hmm. And this really disrupted our nervous systems because the history of humanity was that whenever we've been under threat, we've mitigated through safe social interactions. And now safe social interactions became a threat. The bottom line is I think a degree of of social nourishment is important. So it's not just work and accumulate money or even go on the treadmill, but spend a little time with people that you like and trust. Yeah, we're not saying to quit your job or or quit your responsibilities, whatever it is. It's just this understanding that we as humans need a break. Sometimes we need the ability to fill our fuel, you know, replenish ourselves to have moments of, of safety and sociability and understanding those that's the fuel our tank needs, right? And we're really resilient as a species. For the most part, we can handle a lot of this. We just need we just need the things that make us feel safe in order to buffer up against the stresses of the world and understanding that what makes us feel safe it matters. And that maybe for some people, different things allow them to calm down, relax, being around people you love, being around friends, all of these things, uh, view them as, as he said, you know, just as important as exercising for our long-term health. 
And how do you guys do that in your relationship as father and son? Hey, we, we hang out all the time. Not <laughs> yeah. From a father's perspective, not enough. But um, yeah, exactly. but it, it's really interesting to watch, uh, actually watch Seth and his creativity and his, his passions and really the productivity. I, I just sit back with a smile on my face. So it's not like I, I'm evaluating Seth. I'm just getting tremendous nourishment whenever he calls and shares uh-huh. with me what he's doing. So share some more Seth. Sure. <laughs> and, and I think that's the... What I see, what it comes down to is that it is that social engagement and relationship that really is the, the strongest predictor of, and even the Harvard study, right? The, the strongest predictor of, of a successful life or a fulfilled life is the nature of our safe relationships where we can be who we are and seen and accepted. Yeah, we, I mean, it's, it's kind of entered the realm of conventional wisdom now. I think we all understand the idea that those with strong social support networks are healthier live longer, mm-hmm. do better against almost every physical or mental malady there is. But I think to a lot of people, the the mechanisms and the reasons for that are mysterious. It shouldn't be. It's really simple. Social behavior, having access to safe, to support, to social support, makes our bodies feel safe and allows them to heal. I, I think we have to qualify this because people might, and this is actually the world we're in, people will say, well, I guess I have to force myself, even though I don't like to be around people, to be with people. And the issue is we're talking about feeling safe with people yeah. And trusting people, if you feel safe and trusting of a few, that's fine. But your body needs those experiences. And if your body doesn't feel safe with people, get a dog, get a horse, get a cat even. Yeah. Uh, because you need yeah, we can some- co- We can co-regulate with with dogs. Like, you yeah. know, a lot of people might say, like, I'm just a loner, whatever it is. And I'm not going to tell you to be something you're not. But, you know, dogs and cats, they can make you feel safe, too. There's there's a reason that people love them so much. It's the yeah. truth. Yeah. And it's because those types of social mammals give cues back to our nervous system mm. that enable us to give our give up our defenses. So we yeah. co-regulate with them. We make them feel safe and they make us feel safe. And also, I think a lot of times the the places that we associate with social behavior might feel overwhelming and stressful to people. If, you know, again, loud bars or parties, things like that could make people feel unsafe. So it's about finding scenarios for safe so, social interaction that, that make you feel safe and not trying to force yourself into an environment that doesn't make you feel safe. And final question, and I want to just thank you both for your time, but what's your both of your personal hope for this book dad what's yours okay my personal hope <laughs> is that it it does exactly what uh we've talked about and that's the notion that people who are not therapists or scientists can understand these basic principles uh the theory got traction within the therapy community because it was intuitive whenever anyone actually read any of it they said ah this makes sense it doesn't have to be complicated it makes sense so it's never have i ever gotten a comment this doesn't make any sense so i used to say to people who would come to my workshops and they would say to me oh i learned so much i said come on be honest you best just got a validation of your intuitions. So in reading this book, people get a validation of their intuitions of what they think it is to be a human being. And mm. we basically have outlined or provide a map of those experiences. Yeah, for, for me, it's just giving people the ability to understand that they're not alone when they feel these physiological effects of being anxious mm. or stressed or traumatized understanding what's happening, giving yourself permission to feel them, and giving yourself permission to do things that make you feel safe. Uh, Mm -hmm. Giving yourself permission to prioritize feelings of safety, to prioritize sociability, to prioritize your own health and happiness through that and understanding that if you are able to prioritize prioritize your own health and happiness, you'll be better able to give health and happiness to the people around you who mean something to you, perhaps your kids, if you're a dad listening to this. Let me just add one other point to what Seth was saying. In a sense, by reading the book, you're going to feel better about what it is that you've experienced. You're going to feel better about mm-hmm. yourself. You're going to feel more competent and more resilient. So the book, in a way, is to kind of inform people of the wonderful, resilient toolkit that they have on board. Yeah. yeah. And, I th- and I think you have language, too, as I you know, read through it, and you're, and you're right, Dr. Porges, when I first read Polyvagal Theory, being you know a therapist, and it kind of made sense, but it gave more language. It was like it just took my initial concept and it connected it more to our physiological states, and it started to kind of be a more kind of robust roadmap of what's really going on, like really kind of having a clearer picture. And and I think as people read this too, that they'll get a sense of, oh, that's why I do that. Oh, that makes sense. I feel like it might normalize and maybe, you know, bring some confirmation and peace to them knowing that 
I'm not just messed up or broken or stuck. It's like, oh, no wonder why I'm doing this or no wonder why I'm seeing this. This makes sense now. Okay, I can now do something about it. I don't have to just be kind of succumb to this, these pressures of life or, or, my, or my story, so to speak. But yeah. I want to thank you both so much for your time, Dr. Porges and, and Seth, Dr. Seth. And <laughs> you both have a wonderful, wonderful day. And, and I cannot wait for this to get out in the world more to people to to take this and and my hope too as a as a clinician and as a father is that we can we can really start to bring more healing when we understand what we're really needing in this world which is to feel safe enough to create safety in our relationships when we come across people in our workplaces or random people on the street but to really think through how are we embodying this and generating this to kind of have this co-regulation with the world around us and so thank you for your time you guys have a wonderful day Thank you, Travis.